Okay. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to day two of the Yeovil Chamber Business Fair. And thank you for all coming to hear David Wone speak about death on the high street, not in Yeovil. There is a question mark in the middle, but if I say death on the high street, question mark, it makes me sound like a bit of an idiot, so I'm not going to do that. But I'd like to thank you all for joining us. This is it's great to see so many people in the room. Um, it's quite an open and fluid session. For those of you that don't know David, I'll let him introduce himself properly. But most of you will have seen him either walking around town, talking to people about the town, um, being the president of Yeovil Chamber, and therefore technically, I guess, my boss in some sh way, shape or form. Or you may have seen him sitting on a street corner, singing and playing a guitar. Any of these personas of David are totally correct. And um, all of these give him a unique insight into um, the high street in Yeovil, retail, hospitality, leisure, the whole caboodle. So without any further ado, I'm going to pass over to you, Dave. Thanks for that sterling introduction, Joe. I hope we can live up to all that. Um, I've, got, I've, I've, I've said to Joe before I came on this morning, I'm quite psyched up about this. I, I, I met with James Tovey. Uh, manager of the Queedam, who's in the room today. I met with him last week and he gave me some very valuable insight into what I'm about to relay on to you. Um, I spoke with the refresh manager, Ian Timms, this morning uh, to get a get a, a last minute update on where we are with, with all this. And I've been making copious notes for this, uh, for this, for this webinar. So um, I, what, I, what I'm aiming to do today is uh, just I'll just talk for about 20 to 30 minutes and see where it goes. And if, if you feel like you need to interject at any time with any questions about what I'm saying, please feel free to do so. I tend to um, function a lot better when I'm put on the spot with a question rather than just talk. Um, because if I'm just left to talk, I will talk and talk and talk. So uh, so feel free to cut in any any time. Um, so, um, yeah, as, as Joe says, I'm, I'm David Wone. I'm president of the Oval Chamber of Commerce. Um, today, what I'm going to do is uh, revisit a piece that I wrote on LinkedIn back in May 2019 uh, entitled Death of the High Street. See, there's an inflection there. Death of the High Street, not in Yeovil. And I wrote that in 2019. And normally on LinkedIn, despite the, the quite large network I have on LinkedIn, um, I t not many people actually respond. They just go, yeah, thumbs up and all that. But this, this piece um, got people going. I've got 120 reactions, 37 comments, and 649 views to date on that piece. And most, mostly and significantly from, uh, from a lot of people that I don't know who bought into what I, the, the comments I'd made about that, the high street, the, the positive comments and objective comments that I'd made about the high street in, in Yeovil. Um, and the, and the, big, the big headline uh, in, that, in that piece was, for every business we lost since 2015, uh, in, in the piece it said, two, it said two and a half businesses have come in. That's gone slightly down, probably helped um, or in, in, no, in no small way by the pandemic, but we're down to about 1.7, 1.8 businesses. So for, in other words, for every business we've lost in Yeovil since 2015, 1.8 have come in. So that's the main headline I, I wanna impress on everybody, that the town isn't falling apart despite the best attentions of the, the TV news that uh, I think are more interested in getting bums on seats rather than actually being objective about what's going on on the high street. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna. I'm just gonna uh, revisit. I revisited that piece, and um, what I'm essentially going to do today is just give you an idea on the, the current state of play, the who, the what, the when, um, what's bringing people in, and maybe a possible vision for the future um, for Yeovil. Um, in amongst all the, the uh, those reactions that I had on that LinkedIn piece, there was a lady who labelled me as deluded. Um, and, uh, and yes, there are still plenty of challenges in Yeovil, such as vacant units, leasing and rental arrangements, signage, car parking, ASB, all the usual suspects. In fact, anyone who's been out of town lately will know that Yeovil isn't unique, but what, um, what, I, what I'm picking up is that we are bucking the trend and we are doing stuff 
that he's going to move the, the town forward. Um, but I, I uh, and one of one of the other the other aspects of the, the development in town is that nothing nothing seems to be forced in any particular direction because of the, the high degree of joined up thinking we have in this town. Um, the, a lot of the development has been organic. Uh, and I'll give you an example of that is that uh, back in, I think it was 2008, uh, the district council announced that we had to put something like six and a half thousand new homes in by 2023. And everybody then quite rightly put their arms up in the air and went, bloody hell, where are they all going to go? Where's all the people going to come from and where are they going to work? Um, and quite rightly, that was, the, you know, I was one of the people that threw my arms up in the air and ran, ran around like a headless chicken. But like everything else, those six and a half thousand new homes weren't going to suddenly be parachuted in. And as you know, there are still there, there are still pockets of building work going on around town as part of that, that housing requirement. And the houses are being built. And as the houses are being built, people are coming in. Employment is being created. So the, and, and that reflects on the rest of the town. The rest of the town is growing in, in an organic a very organic way. Um, from my point of view, things do look fairly positive, fairly, fairly upbeat, but I still think that the true effect on the business sector from the pandemic will be revealed when the furlough scheme lifts in, in September. Uh, we will see the true effect of it there. Um, but I have to say, uh, in listening to a lot of the businesses throughout the pandemic, uh, and this goes for the retailers in town as well, uh, there's been a high degree of resilience, pragmatism, creativity, cooperation. It's it's all very positive, and in that sense, um, and but it's like any change. There, there's going to be winners, winners and losers. There's going to be casualties. This is this is change and its evolution. And the pandemic speeded up the thought process, altered supply chains, tipped businesses over, empowered others. So it's it. it as I said, I'm, I'm just trying to paint a picture of, of where we are now and, and where we are and where we're moving towards. But I have to say, not not many actually fell over because of the pan pandemic. You know, no, there's not many businesses out there actually failed entirely because of the pandemic. The majority of the casualties that I've seen so far, the, and we, we know them, the big the big ones, top uh, uh, Laura Ashley, Monsoon, Debenhams, those kind of casualties, they they weren't in the best of health when the pandemic struck. And uh, a lot of those businesses, um, they had fairly rigid business models and they couldn't adapt to the change. The change has happened um, seismically um, to do with the pandemic and uh, the pandemic simply tipped them over. So, um, but here we are in Yo now and things are beginning to, well, they're, they're, they're just, moving along and I was in the Queen Anne the other day uh, when, I, when I met James and um, I think hopefully James will um, help me on this. Uh, I, I did, a, did a head count on the number of units, number of vacant units in the Queen Anne and there were only seven out of 41. Would that be, is it 41 units there James? 52. 52. On, on Middle Street. Well, that that makes our percent the percentage look even better. Then it was se I only counted seven empty empty units in the Quida, and that is you know that will give you an idea of where we are in Yeovil, um, and and it's people like the Quida who, who are creating the conditions that are bringing people into town, um, creating uh, red uh, good good rent deals for new people coming in, and. Um, offering a, a, a range of options and just making the environment right for people to come in and say to, to want to set up in in town and uh, it's uh, and the, the businesses are coming in driven by driven by demand uh, they are they're, they're, they're coming in because there is demand in town um, for example a lot of people say to me what are all these coffee shops doing in town? What are all these hairdressers doing in town? They see a demand. And I do I do believe that those sectors will settle down. We may see some people drop off out of out of the numbers uh, in the in the coffee shops and hairdressers. But they, they are coming in because there's, there is a clear demand 
um, and also it gives you a clue as to where, where town centres are going. Uh, no longer is retail the reason for coming into town, it is just a reason for coming into town and hairdressing and coffee shops are two things that you can't get online. So uh, the town centres are creating an environment to get people away from uh, away from their, their devices and out onto the, onto the high street. And the internet itself has become a way of life. Some, some predicted the, the, that it would be the end of the world as we knew it in a business sense, in a, certainly in a high street sense. Um, but I, I believe that, that the inter, internet now is, is our friend. And we've, become, we've come so far down the road now with the internet that I go as far as to say that that if uh, if the internet fell over tomorrow, a lot of businesses would would fail simply because they are now reliant on the internet. But the the ele elephant in the room is business rates. Uh, they they I don't I don't believe there is a level playing field as regards business rates. Uh, I have been lobbying uh, whoever will listen uh, about this. And we do need to level the playing field out. In other words, what, what's happening? There are, there are businesses out there, especially the smaller independents who rely on the physical presence on the high street. I believe they're being almost penalised for being on the high street. And businesses like Amazon, who can set up offshore and don't pay UK business rates, are getting off pretty much scot-free. And they are monopolising the online market. So we do need to we do need some change in that respect. Um, as I said, I mentioned I, I spoke with uh, James Tovey uh, last week and uh, had picked up some very useful in, insight from from James. Uh, the, the we the 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 pandemic has affected people in unique ways. Um, all of us have a different story to tell about the impact on us from the pandemic, um, but there are there are certain sectors of business that were that, that were hit harder than others. Uh, that's mainly mainly uh, the leisure and hospitality industry, and certainly in a retail effect, a high, in the high street, it was fashion uh, and the, the kind of beauty beauty uh, therapy sector uh, were, were, were challenged by all that. Um, but there is a uh, yeah, and, and it also impacts in, in other, other subtle, more subtle ways as well. For example, uh, there's, a, there's an impact on, on quality. People are, um, when they're being let out from, uh, from lockdown, um, instead of going to their, their favourite shoe shop and buying their, their favorite, uh, a nice pair of shoes, they will pick up the, say, some school shoes from a, a trip to Asda when they're doing the the shopping trip they'll pick it up from George so the high street is is still is still suffering from that um and I think we're, we're still we're still taking it a day at a time out there we have to we can't we certainly know more than a week at a time uh and it, it it's about making sure that you keep your eyes and eyes and ears open in a business sense and uh just just try and be adaptable and that's what we've seen in Yeovil. we've seen adaptability to a very high degree I, I listened to dozens of businesses uh week in week out throughout the pandemic and the the adjectives that spring to mind are resilience cooperation pragmatism prudency uh reviewing things cooperation um and people are prepared to do something different to get themselves through this um and the, uh, the the local authority, just moving on slightly, the, the the local authority are still ambitious. For those of you who think that yeah, uh, there there are areas of town that still look a bit a bit shabby, you are correct. Um, as I said earlier on, I know where the pressure where the pressure lies, and um, but the I, I spoke with the the local authority refresh project manager this morning and uh, and uh, the headlines are that there's nine uh, we Yeovil has managed to acquire 9.75 million pounds from the the high street fund through a bid that was put in during 2020 
uh, 4.8 million pounds of that will be spent on what's called the public realm, which is tidying up the streets, creating civic space and making better use of the public space in and around town. The rest of the money is being spent on on um, private development. Uh, there are several private investors at play behind the scenes in in the town and uh, the estimated future to, future value to Yeovil when the when the refresh project is finally done um, and I think there's something like a three to four year spend window on the money on that and the it's estimated that it, uh, the refresh project will, will be worth over 100 million pounds to the future value of, of Yeovil Town Centre so um, so everything everything looks looks fairly good in town. Um, any any questions at this stage at all? There's a question in the chat from Ruth, Dave. Okay, uh, I'll pick it up. Uh, Ruth, uh, yeah, um, I'll, I'll just introduce Ruth. I, I met Ruth uh, yesterday for the first time in a virtual sense uh, on the phone. Um, Ruth is the, I, I believe you're the regional manager for the Federation of Small Business, is that right? Development manager, because uh, I, which means nothing really, but I look after members across um, Somerset, North Somerset, Swindon and Wiltshire. So I, I've, I've invited Ruth down in July, we're going to have a walk about and see if there's any synergies between FSB and the, uh, and the Chamber and uh, see if we can get you involved in that epidemic of joined up thinking that we have here in Yeovil. Um, okay, uh, so your, it says, your question was, I've had a lot of feedback that retailers are really struggling to recruit enough staff. Is that something you were all seeing in Yeovil? Um, can, I, can I throw that one at you, James? Um, because I'm, oh, I'm sure. yeah, uh, just, uh, Ruth, this is James Tovey. James Tovey, I think I mentioned him on the phone when we spoke. He's the, the retail liaison manager. Thank you. Yes, I think James and I met uh, probably a couple of years ago now, James. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He came back and came up into the office and we did a face to face meeting, if you can imagine. Yeah, all oh, those were the days. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I think, I mean, not really would be the, the short answer. I don't think our retailers are experiencing a, a drought or anything kind of close to that. Um, I think what they are seeing is a couple of things because we, are, we have unfortunately had some major retailers closing the town centre then becomes a bit more of a pool of, um, of you know, ex-shop workers and supervisors and key holders and a little bit of a talent pool to, to choose from. So we, we've seen, which has been quite nice to see actually, you know, when we've had like the Mother Cares close or, uh, you know, more recently, the Laura Ashley close. Well, actually, you know, I, I kind of bump into those ex-staff in, in you know, Pets at Home or Hobbycraft or, you know, one of them's actually opened their own business. So... I think you've got that is kind of offsetting things a little bit. Um, one of the things that I would say is a smaller challenge, but is something just to watch out for, I think, for, for the retailers. Is we've seen a bit of a shift, or I've, I've heard of a shift of people looking at different professions now because of the whole gig economy. And I know a few people that you know are, are now uber drivers or, or they are now deliveroo drivers because actually you know they don't want to do the weekends they want something that suits them so i think there's a few quite a few things at play but i think a few people have maybe questioned do they want to do bank holidays and christmases for the rest of their life actually there's some other stuff out there now uh, and maybe their priorities have changed a little bit through through um through lockdown or whatever but yeah, I think in a nutshell, not not really. You know, they're not struggling to, to staff their shops necessarily and they're finding some good good people. But um, yeah, that'd be my take on it. Yeah, thanks. Did that answer your question, Ruth? Yes, that was really interesting. Thanks, James. Appreciate okay, that. Yeah, yeah. And, and just again, it's I, I don't think there'll be I don't think there's gonna be a bounce back. Um I, James and I agreed on a lot of things when we met uh, last week. Uh, there's there's no there's not going to be any sudden bounce back on this it's it's, it's just going to be a continuing evolution um, but the thought process has been speeded up by by the pandemic experience in a in a kind of logistic and um, and a, a kind of uh, technology sense um, but I, I do believe as with all of these things and I've been in 
my own career in financial services long enough to see several global events come and go. But I just um, the pandemic and the high street and retail, I just think that those that have a stake in it will manage this and see it through. It's easy, very easy to get emotional about this and focus on people who are struggling. But it's always the same with change. I can't I can't take that challenge away. I can't take that change away. But what I can do um, in my position is try to bring people in, give them the insight, give them the support that they need. And very often when people know the situation a little bit more, they tend to be a bit more positive about their own situation. Um, and it, do, it doesn't seem quite so hopeless. But um, but the I think the key word at the moment is agility. Um, and, uh, I, and and I, I know a lot of us are actually fatigued of all this online stuff. I would much rather be stood in a room with everybody rather than stare, staring at a screen. But uh, we, we have to we have to manage this through. So I, th I think the people, the stakeholders, people who manage the situation, the doers and the changers and the shakers will continue, will will move this forward. Um, as I said, I try not to get too upset about some of the individual cases. And and as I said, there are winners and losers, but they, we will we will get through this. I'm making it sound like it's. It's, it's something like the end of the world. And I know it has been for, for some people. There's been some absolutely toe curling challenges out there. But I think by and large, notwithstanding the, the removal of furlough, I think the, uh, the pandemic have to a degree fallen over. They, they have become the casualties already. Um, so, as, as, as I said, in Yeovil, we're trying. We're trying to look forward. We uh, look forward. We're trying to bring people in, support people, and the investors looking at Yeovil are still ambitious. Um, at, a, at a time when many other local authorities are, pull, are pegging back on on investment, uh, South Somerset District Council, and notwithstanding any changes that might be coming up as regards that unit. OK, we seem to have lost David, I'm afraid, mid-sentence there. It's not his most See. flattering look. Uh, you're back again, David. Sorry, you're freezing quite regularly at the moment. So I was just... Oh, was that, did I go there? there? Oh, I was... Sorry about that. I, if you can repeat uh, what we were just saying when you've frozen uh, again, that would be great. I think you've stayed uh, about the unit, um, notwithstanding the changes in the unitary authority. And yeah, then you froze. <laughs> OK, yeah, notwithstanding the changes in the... In, coming up to the, the unitary authority, the, the local uh, just South Somerset District Council remain ambitious. They're, they're putting a lot of seed money in. We've got that 9.75 million pounds from the High Street Fund, and they're pushing ahead with these, with these projects. And uh, most of you around the room will be aware of those projects because you've heard me talk about them, but also the District Council are making a, a great play of this. And uh, so, it's it looks good as i said the the, the headline to to that, that i always i'm trotting out is i'm looking at a head count of businesses coming in versus those going out and we are still in a positive for every business we've lost since 2015 1.8 have come in and i do i uh, I, I've, I have a spreadsheet that i tally up every now and again and it's yeah 1.8 have come in for every one lost so we are we are bucking the trend here in Yeovil, we're, we're pushing forward. Um, okay, uh, uh, any questions, oh, John? Um, yeah, you just mentioning the unitary authority and the, yeah. the, can't remember the words that you described it, but the, not yeah. the pandemic, but the joined up thinking that you, you're so uh, How, How will that be impacted by the unitary authority? Um, it's it's difficult to say. I've, I've been to the briefings of both parties, both the one Somerset for the, the single authority from Somerset County Council and by the, the stronger Somerset, which it which essentially will break Somerset into two portions, which is uh, East and South Somerset in one and West and North Somerset in another. Um, as, as regards the impact, I'm aware that this did occur in Dorset about five years ago. If uh, somebody wants to correct me on that, I think it was about five years ago. 
Um, and I, I'm in regular contact with businesses from Dorset. And to be honest, nobody mentioned it. It happened uh, it almost overnight without anybody noticing. Um, my, my concern, uh, and uh, this isn't about the impact, it's just a concern that I have uh, given, given the position I'm in, is that uh, the relationship that Chamber has and the business sector has with South Somerset District Council at the moment is very agile. It's very positive. It's, it runs very day to day. And there's some there's some uh, a lot of one to one work goes on. And I put it to the, the one Somerset bid. Uh, I went to their briefing that uh, I was concerned that that might fall over if it goes over to everything being centralised. Uh, and I have to say, and I can I can. Um, I, I don't think I'm talking out of turn here, that they didn't really allay my fears. They said that they would put people on the ground locally, but they weren't specific about who they would put on the ground. Because from my point of view, um, a lot of this joined up thinking is all about people. It's about interpersonal relationships, it's about positivity and people connecting. And if they just parachute people in on a local level, it could tip over a lot of the work that the business sector and the chamber are doing. So that's a potential impact. I don't know. I, I'm not sure if that answers your question, John, but it, it uh, that's, you know, it, it, whichever way this goes um, in, a, in a local authority sense, I don't know what the impact will be. All I do know is that the I, I will make every effort to bring the business sector together to support whatever manifests itself off the back of it. Can I jump yeah. in, Dave, just whilst we're on this, the topic and you've mentioned the refresh a few times and mentioned meeting with Ian Thames, that yeah. um, if people want to know more um, about that, then we have a Chamber event next Thursday um, with Ian Thames coming to talk to us about very specifically about the overall refresh project. And there's still some, I've just checked, you might see me glance that way, I've just checked that there are still a few spaces available. So anyone wants to find out more specifically about the refresh project then come along to that one next Thursday unfortunately we couldn't get that in in this week as well with what as you what you can see is already a busy schedule but yeah. with regard to the high street Dave um, I think that one of the things that I know we've spoken about before and one of the perceptions that people have is that there's a lot of empty space in the high street what unfortunately has happened I think and I know we spoke about is big places have gone, big noticeable properties are empty. But as you mentioned with the statistics, a lot of smaller properties, a lot of smaller businesses have moved in. One of the things that interests me is not being a retailer, but um, office space in the town. And I wondered if you could maybe tell us a bit more about what your view is on office space within town. Um, and there's been a lot in the national press about people living in towns and putting more retail space in town centres and how that mixed dynamic could work for Yeovil or maybe it couldn't work for Yeovil and what your view on that is. Um, is that something that's more relevant to me as a, as a business owner? Yeah, it's... Um, not sure where to, where to start. There were several facets to that. The I think it's important to create a balance um, in town, whatever we do in town, the the, the three the three areas I think that uh, that all this, I'm, I'm being um, uh, the the information that's coming in is is the development will go uh, down th three three roads: residential, um, commercial, and retail. As I've said, the old model is well and truly over. That old retail model that people my age sort of do tend to cling on to that idea that we go into town to go shopping it is over. There is a clear um, demand and an evidential migration back into towns again. Um, and again, that's manifesting itself by the, by the, the, um, uh, the, the, the amount of residential work that is being done, uh, residential space that is being created. Um, there is a lot of surplus space in town and I don't, honestly believe that it will be filled by retail again so we have to fill it with something um, otherwise it just becomes dead space and that's that's what the private developers and the and the local authority I think are seeing they 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 need to fill that space but it has to be done organically and with a sense of balance in other words the demand has to be there for whatever it is that comes in 
and then that demand has to be supported. Um, so I, uh, I don't, I'm not sure if that answers your question, Joe, but it's, it's, it's going to be a balance of retail, residential and commercial. Thank you. It does, because I think that balance is what we're striving for to make the, the town centre and the high street more sustainable, is it not? Yeah, and I, and I, w I will stress again that the, if, if you get fixated on the idea that the town is somehow uh, there for retail, um, you will be disappointed. The, the curtain has come down on that old model and towns, town centres now, and Yeovil again isn't unique in this respect, it's about experience, it's about coming in, live, live work, play in the town, do business um, and make it a good safe environment with plenty to do in a multifaceted sense. It has to be an experience now and not just a retail trip. Um, Marie's got her hands up. Marie. Hi, Marie. Hi. Uh, yeah, I just thought I'd just chip in a bit on that question. And, and it's, you're right, um, the future of the town will change in terms of the mix and the development. And I think going back to your sort of point, Dave, about relationships between all the different partners and authorities, uh, I work for SSDC, by the way, just in case people don't know who I am, uh, the District Council uh, in the Economic Development Team. And uh, I think that the relationships between all the partner organisations are really, really important in the town centre um, in terms of trying to connect with the, the landlords and the property owners as well, because permitted development rights, if, if the town were just kind of left to its own devices without any intervention at all, I think you just see some probably fairly poor quality housing popping up left, right and centre um, because the government are changing the sort of planning policy laws quite regularly to sort of loosen, loosen things up and allow more um, residential to, to come forward without too much um, sort of uh, rules and regulations around that. But I think that because everyone's working really strongly together, hopefully we can steer the right kind of residential de uh, developments in the town centre rather than just, um, you know, it being filled with poor quality housing that then we've got different problems uh, to deal with. So those relationships that we have, we've built and continue to build really really important to make sure we get the right kind of development in town centre so yeah. Um, yeah. so we're on the front foot I'd say yeah on that, on that uh, school. and I, I just just picking up on what Marie's saying there about the, about the joined up thinking I, I, I work very closely with Marie and I'm also Marie and I are in contact with private developers and, and just on that subject of raising the quality bar in Yeovil. Um, some of the flats that are being built in, in town have rents that start at £650 a month and for a flat that's quite quite a lot for a lot of people but it kind of raises the bar in that respect. Um, but uh, yeah it's about it's about balance. If you go too far down one particular road, in other words if there's too much commercial or there's too much retail or there's too much residential, the other you know if there's too much of one the other two suffer so it, it's it's important to get that balance right and that's where, where it's slightly important and I always give this message out to the business sector talk to me if you don't know anything in town or you want to know something or you or you want to have an input to what goes on talk to me and I feed it through to people like Marie and um, uh, uh, Ian Timms who's coming in next week to talk and, and they then feed that it directly into the system, which enables the local authority to move forward on these projects and get things done around town. So, uh, so yeah, I'm glad you're in the room today, Marie. So thanks for that. That's all right. Richard. Uh, yeah, thanks, David. I, I've got a sort of two part question. It might actually be directed at James, really. Um, so it's sort of connected with business rates, but, but a number of years ago, I was, I can't remember who said this, but they, basically echoed what you said that the, the the old method of coming into town to shop and, and going and it, it, you know it, it's dead because that's how it used to be and then people might come back into town if they wanted to have the nighttime economy so i was told years ago that this sort of blend of the daytime nighttime economy should be a way to do it you could get 
empty shops where you know there's sort of ping pong or, or whatever and people could come in during the day for, for that sort of activity and sort of hang around and stay i know in the quidam they've got a gym there and stuff which i think is brilliant because it's people coming in at all sorts of times a day and then they could be doing commerce there as well is there a you know I think Queen Anne have done a really, really good job of that because they've got a lot more control over what they do. Is, is, are we still hamstrung with the handbrakes on in regards to the sort of the, 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 the actual town centre because of business rates and things like that? And what do you know about what the long term plan is for that? It's a complex um, question. But... Yeah, Thanks. well, I'm, yeah, I'm happy to jump in on business rates and I'll try not to get on too much with soapbox or anything like that. <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean, it's. It's the one thing that we can't control, you know, and, and you obviously can read social media comments or hear comments about landlord rates and rents and how inflexible they are. And, you know, from a personal standpoint, you know, the truth is very far from the common perception. You know, we're, we're very agile, very, um, you know, we work with all the tenants because that's kind of what we have to do. I mean, I think with business rates, it's, yes, there's been support, we're waiting for a review. I believe it's in September to let us know kind of where we're going next with it. Um, there's been holidays and now it's kind of, you know, it's gone from zero and that's 33% and that'll be to the end of the financial year. So we're still in a bit of a guessing game with it. The one thing I would say really about the business rates is that it is a, it's an ancient, ancient system that is from a bygone era. And, you know, I think where, even where we were pre-pandemic uh, with leasing agents and myself and tenants and the landlord and directors from asset management companies, we've had to change. We were, we were pretty good before. We were pretty agile. We were working in partnership with everyone. And we, we like to think we were doing, um, you know, doing a good job of it, but we've had to change, not radically, but speed up kind of our, our ways of thinking, you know, turnover leases, uh, you know, flexibility on terms, uh, neutral break clauses that you put in, because God knows where we're going to be. So we've done all that, but we still have a system from years and years and years ago, which doesn't recognise pandemic, doesn't recognise internet, doesn't recognise how footfall has dropped off, doesn't recognise how shoppers shop these days. So it is an issue. What I would say is that through having the business rates holidays, that is basically what's enabled us to support, uh, I think we're up to about 13 or 14 independent businesses to come into the Queen Dam. So as you can imagine, without going into too much detail, we can, because we don't have that hanging over us or they don't have that business rates hanging over them, we can then have a very easy conversation about them coming in at a more affordable rate to springboard and then grow to something else. If it kicks back in at 100%, there will be a domino effect I predict, for not just the independents but for the national retailers as well because it's a cost that is is unsustainable for a lot of them so it's that i, I said i wouldn't get on a soapbox like that wasn't too soapboxy but the, the reality is it's it's a it's a tough one i see both sides of it i see that it's, it's revenue you know and it's you can't just cut that off you know that revenue goes somewhere it supports all sorts of things i'm sure within local authority and, and councils but you know, it's it's a very tricky act because if you wrap that up to drive the revenue, then you lose the businesses that will never be able to pay any business rates in the town centre. So, it's uh, it is tricky. So are you saying that then essentially major reform from government down is 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 the only way of doing it? And did I not hear something not too long ago that they were doing that, or is that hot air? Yeah, know? yeah. I mean that that from again from the the papers I read, as in the government papers, not the uh, newspapers necessarily, and the, <laughs> keep, keeping up with the news. Um, it, the last thing I heard September is when we're going to get the announcement on the business rates review. That has been that date's been moved a number of times now. I think at one point it was in May. Um, so we will see, you know, uh, whether that comes in the form of a sales tax or something that's just added onto VAT and therefore it's leveling the playing field for, you know, if you're um, strictly online, strictly bricks and mortar or both and on the channel and all the rest of it. But, you know, it's fairly clear that at the moment the, the scales are tipped towards online versus bricks and mortar because you're taxed at, you know, the, Retailers that used to turn over two million probably turn over 1.2 now, but they're still paying the same amount of tax from the pandemic that they were before. So that cost hasn't changed, but their turnover probably has, and their margins now squeezed and all the other stuff. So 
Yes, I mean, you know, the, the good news is that a, a reform is coming, we think, or at least there's a review of it, so we'll hop far until September and, and see what that is, as long as it doesn't get moved. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. That that is that is uh, the the real elephant in the room, though the business rates. Um, as as James rightly said, it's a, it's from a bygone era. Um, the sooner change comes about to level it level it out and uh, make, if I can use the word, make online based businesses pay their way in the same way that uh, or or a more equitable way than. Uh, businesses in the high street are made to pay the better the sooner that comes in the better um and, and as i've said i'm all, i'm already through my channels at uh, somerset chamber and uh through the lep and direct connections to uh, the british chambers of commerce i'm i'm just shouting out about that to anyone who will listen and it's notable as well that the uh, the chief executive of asda um came out uh, I don't know if anybody saw it in the news about six months ago, I think it was. The, the chief executive of Asda came out and said just what I've just said. He wrote an open letter, which was directed at the government, saying you need to change this before the high street is absolutely decimated by an imbalance in business rates. So, so yes, I think that's the real elephant in the room. I think we uh, just add to a final piece on business rates because you know we are talking about death of the high street and it's a, it's a huge part of it it's you know if you're doing your PL and you what your contribution is it's, it's a massive chunk out of your uh, you know your outgoings and, and quite often it'll be a lot more than the rent you know um the other thing to say about business rates is they're based on you know each property has a rateable value so whenever you know the last rateable value or the last rating was 2017 i believe and at that point you know we were pre still probably rating units way above a market rent so you know we still have um if business rates kick in whatever percentage they are that percentage is based on however much that value has uh, however much that property that unit whatever value it has attributed to it so even if we have a 33 percent um, rates payable you know i.e 66 percent reduction if that's on a property that was rated as £150,000 market rent value in 2017, you can bet your bottom dollar it isn't £150,000 market rent now. So there's there's other things at play, but I'm, I'm sure, you know, I'll, I'll live in optimism that all this will come out in, in the wash and we'll, we'll, we'll at least see some recognition of, you know, this, this major issue. And I, you know, you call it an elephant in the room, I don't think it's an elephant in the room, it comes up in most conversations I have with independent businesses or stakeholders or clients or what have you, you know, I think it, it's not, we can't, can't hide away from the conversation now. It, it comes out of the bottle, there's a government view on it. It's, it's not a dark, dirty thing to talk about. It's like, let's just be honest about it because, you know. Yeah, it, I, I think the genie out of the bottle is probably a better phrase than elephant in the room. It does, it does pervade. It, it, it's sort of it, it, it's there all the time. It, does, it, it doesn't. It, this issue isn't going to go away until change comes in. And I'm 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 in a sector which which it's functions online. So I'm I'm if you like an offender on that. And if change comes about, I'm happy to understand why I'll suddenly be paying business rates um, because the the government might come around to setting this up as a level playing field. But um, but yeah, um, any any other question? Any other questions at all? If I... I don't think there's any other questions, Dave. Um, do you want to sort of summarise? I know you started with a summary, but maybe summarise and yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll, so so uh, just see if I can summarise this. So what's to love about Yeovil then? Um, it's it's my town. I'm proud of it. Uh, I've, I've got trouble is I've got an emotional tie to it. I, but so to try and put that to one side, I've reached out to some public, some key public and private sector figures um, who had come into Yeovil from outside. Jane, one of which was James Toby. I think Marie, you, I asked you this as well because um, Marie comes from Tamworth and James is from Birmingham. Is it or was it Wolverhampton? Oh, well, <laughs> I know you've got the shopping centre in Wolverhampton, but yeah, so it's Birmingham. So they, people like people like James and Marie have come in from outside and they see the town for what it is. And I asked them just two questions. Uh, first one was, what made you come to Yeovil? And the second one was, why, why are you still here? 
and the, their responses um, added to six or seven other people I spoke with from a similar demographic. In other words, people who come in from outside and are chosen to get involved in key positions in Yeovil, um, they all pretty much said the same thing. They said Yeovil Town, Town Centre has everything I need. This beautiful countryside right on my doorstep. It's a good, safe place to work, run a business and raise a family. The schools are good. There's plenty to do and see in my leisure time. And there are two coasts, two seaside areas, just a 45 minute drive away from Yeovil. And as one of them said to me, why would I be anywhere else? So, um, so employment wise, I asked myself, what's what, it, what is bringing people to Yeovil? And the, answer, the short answer is manufacturing and healthcare. Um, they, they are our major employees in the town. Indeed, manufacturing uh, 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 you, uh, you utilizes over 20% of the Yeovil workforce. We make things here um, with a leading focus on aerospace technology and innovation supply chains. Um, healthcare, the NHS is a major employer across the town, uh, which is also home to a large regional hospital hub. Um, we've, we're beginning to attract legal and financial service providers in a regional sense. Um, this building, construction, property maintenance, and we have a good healthy um, population of entrepreneurs coming in. Um, so, and, and the other thing that Yoga, I think, has in its favour um, is that it, geographically, it's over 50 kilometres away from all the regional centres like Bristol, Bournemouth and Exeter. So we've got plenty of space here. We've got our own natural catchment area and our area of influence reaches out to an estimated 140,000 people with, road, with good road rail uh, on, and online connectivity. And there's even, even two airports, um, Exeter, is what 45 minutes away they're at their airport so we're, we're well connected in a logistical physical sense um and there we have an I, I, I touched on it earlier on we've got an epidemic of joined up thinking here nothing's off limits in my book the business sector has a big voice we joined at the hip with a visionary local authority Stakeholders, local government, the business sector and the wider, wider community all by and large network and communicate with each other. We embrace challenge and change here in Yeovil. We have a track record of not sitting around and waiting for central government to say OK on anything. We tend to float our own boat, but but we're not inwards looking. And this is key. We're not we're not parochial here. We, we understand that we want to bring people in. But at the same time, we're never afraid to look upwards and reach outwards to what's going on around us um uh we one of one of the one of the uh, additional sort of spin-off things we've done and I, I, uh, john beak is in the room for me to hear me say this we signed the armed forces covenant um last year uh our major employer uh leonardo helicopters have also signed the same thing and what the armed Co forces covenant does it uh, provides employment opportunity for the spouses of serving military personnel and their families and also provides employment opportunity for military personnel who are who are coming out of the of the military and looking to go into what they used to call civvy street i don't know what they call it now but they're going to civi civilian work and with a uh um, one of the royal navy's biggest air bases um, right on our doorstep. That's no small thing. And we are taking steps as well at Yeovil Chamber to try and reconnect the airbase with the town. And John, John will know about the conversations that I'm having with the airbase about that. So all my efforts now as chamber, uh, president of the chamber, and to, indeed I'm trying to get this message across to the whole business sector, it's about ramping up what we already have here. We've got a ton of stuff here in Yeovil. The, 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 uh, as I've already described, the, the high street is, is managing the situation. It's, it's coming out of the pandemic um, leaner and fitter. Um, and I have to get that message out there to ramp up. We, we're trying to ramp up what we're already doing here and to try and turn heads towards, towards Yeovil. Um, and... That's, that's basically it, really. I'll, I'll just do a quick bit on Yeovil Chamber. Yeovil Chamber, um, in, in amongst all that, we currently deliver benefits to over 100 businesses across all sectors 
and sizes. We reach out, and as, you, as you've guessed from what I've been talking about this morning, we're in regular dialogue with local and regional government and all the key stakeholders across town. We join the dots. We are a dot joiner. Uh, it's about networking like-minded people, gaining insight from the key players and feeding that insight to and from the people who can make the change via a single large voice. Um, so that's pretty much it from me. I, I would say uh, death of the high street, not in Yeovil. So um, it, does anybody have any, any more questions for me? Yeah, I'd just like to say something, Dave, if I may. Yeah. I put a link on, on the chat bar there to an article in The Guardian about what they've done in Stockton on Tees, which mm. is probably a town the size of Yeovil, where they've uh, virtually uh, knocked it all down, the town centre, and, and created a, a huge uh, open space, a green open space, like a central park, and then exposed the river, which for centuries or decades, should I say, um, they turned their backs on, but now they're very proud to have it. We don't have that river in Yeovil, but we... We have the opportunity to create a, a green space in the town centre, uh, you know, down the bottom end of Middle Street, the bus station, that area there. Wouldn't it be wonderful to have something like that where people could gather? Um, and I, I would uh, just uh, say to people, uh, especially those on the council, uh, and I think I probably uh, know that they are looking at Stockton on Tees, um, I think we just have to, to look a little bit above, you know, the idea of shops and retail. It isn't about, town centres are not just about that anymore. They are about providing that experience uh, and that open space. And uh, we need to get an open space in the town. I think that will bring people in. So Stockton on Tees, I think that's pointing the way. Uh, the link is there. It's, on, it's, it's from The Guardian about a month ago. It was written in The Guardian all about what they're doing up there. Uh, and I put the link on the chat bar. I, I saw that there, Steve. Thank, thank you, thank you for that. I mean, it's the in in the piece, the original piece that I wrote, the death of the high street, back in 2019. There, in in amongst all the comments, there is a link to another piece in the Guardian about a town in in France called um, I don't know how you pronounce it. It's Mulhouse. Mal it's yeah. it's down on the Swiss border. And they were the laughing stock of all the, the butt of all the high street jokes in, in France for years. And um, they began this program of joined up thinking and working with the local authority. And the local authority were doing things like um, they, were, they were offering anybody that come in that, that was coming in from outside to set up a shop in the town centre. They, their shop front would get a makeover courtesy of the local authority. And now I think there was something like 300 new businesses came in at the time when this piece was written in 2019. There'd been over 300 new businesses had come into the town centre at, at Mulhouse, which had which had evolved into the go, one of the go to fashionable places uh, for, for high street retail in France. So it can be done. And as I said earlier on, this is all about an evolution. We shouldn't get fixated on models and the way things are done. We, um, we, we need to take this a, a day, a week at a time and reach out to each other and communicate and just move things forward. Just one, you know, if we can move things forward one day at a time, then I, I think success isn't guaranteed, but it, it's going to result in a positive, a positive outlook and a positive future. And just picking up on what you were saying there, Steve, about Stockton on Tees, we have a unique selling point here in Yeovil at the, the Country Park. Um, and the refresh project you know, will will open up and signpost and bring in in a kind of mental sense. In other words, people will think it's closer. It will bring Nine Springs closer into the into the town centre. So so we do have we already have that. And I think what what you've seen at play in Stockton on Tees. Now we'll read that article. Is is slowly manifest, manifesting itself here in Yeovil. So. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm gonna, we've got two minutes left on the clock, yeah. Dave, so I'm done. Um, I need to keep tight on time because we've got a very busy schedule, so I'm done. I know I'm you done. can talk about this for the whole week of the week, the whole week of the business fair, so I'm not going to do that, incidentally, but no. um, I'd like to thank you very much for giving up your time, not only to um, present today and talk to us about this, and obviously to people like James and Marie as well, who've also added some value to what you've been saying and some um, first-hand case studies and so forth to that. But I'd also like to thank you for the time you've taken in researching all of this and for the continued work that you do for the town centre on behalf of Yeovil Chamber and the whole town. Um,
coming up later today as part of the business fair, which you know, I'm very glad that to see so many people here doing. Um, at one o'clock, we have John Beek, who is middle of my screen, could be anywhere on your screen. He's going to be talking to us about the armed forces government and how that can help your business. So I really urge you all to come along to that. At three o'clock, we've got um, Amanda Whitlock from Total Wellbeing Matters, who's going to be talking to us about um, looking after your own mental health and the mental health of your teams and signs to look out for. It's a really, really good session. I've been on four or five of her sessions now, and I cannot stress enough how important it is for you to come along to that one as well. Um, and then at five o'clock, clashes with the football. I'm really, really sorry. You'll only miss the first half. It'll all be over by half time anyway. Spend some better time and come along and um, join one of our patrons, the Oval College, who are going to be talking specifically about hospitality and retail apprenticeships. So very much along this whole theme of keeping our high street growing, keeping it vibrant and bringing new blood in there. There's a whole no another three days to follow after today. So if that wasn't enough, go on the website, have a look. There's all sorts of things. There's how to get your website found on Google. There's about wills and LPAs how they affect your business, there's stuff on construction industry, there's all sorts of sessions. I haven't even mentioned my own session because no one wants to find out about branding, so that's absolutely fine. But please join us. All the links are on the website. They're all free activities um, and events to come along to. And, you know, again, I'd just really like to thank you all for coming along and for supporting your business <laughs> there. And, um, that's the best caption we've had all week. It's the only <laughs> caption we've had all week, but it's still the best one. So um, thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. See you. Thank you. Thanks. 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 Thank you. Bye. Bye. <laughs>